This is a group called Freckoland, right? And Freckoland, they do like a bunch of kid songs. And so when my kids were wee, like, see this CD? I, it, yeah, it was on like repeat in our car all the time. Especially if I was trying to get them to like nap during car time. It would be like, okay, put that on, maybe even like a little white noise machine in the back, and it was boom, kids were asleep. And then you would just drive around and around and around and around and around. And we paid eight and a half bucks a gallon for gas, but what sort of price do you put on a good nap, right? Yeah. So like sometimes you just sometimes you just did that, right? So that's that's where we were at. So Freckoland was a group, and actually, so shout out to my my sister-in-law and brother-in-law, Ashley and Joel. They did the cover art for this album, so that's pretty cool. So that was a little Joel and Ashley Selby illustration. So shout out, shout out to you guys. They're at home because they're not feeling well. But yeah, so Freckoland, right? So on, on this album, there was a song, and it used to drive me mental. All right, sorry, Freckoland people. It was, you're really talented. But this song was called Why, Why, Why? All right, maybe it was actually just called Why. But in the song, it repeats that word Why over and over and over again. But if you're a parent... You can relate to that because it's a word you hear a lot, right? So here's, here's the lyrics to the song because it's kind of cute. So I'm going to go ahead and, and read it. And I'm going somewhere with this, right? So, Freckoland, why? Why do the leaves fall from the trees? Why does honey come from the bees? Why do I have to put on my shoes? Why is the blue sky blue? Oh, why, 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 why? Why can't I stay up all night? Why don't two wrongs make a right? Why do I have to get out of bed? That's a good one. Why does sunburn make me red? Oh, why, 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 why? Why can't I have ice cream for lunch? Also a good question, by the way. <laughs> why does cereal make a crunch? Why does a car horn make a beep? And why don't fish have feet? So why, 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 why? Why can't I tear apart your $20 bill? Because daddy will not be happy. All right, there's the answer to that. Why do windows need window sills? Jack? That's a good question, actually. Why does broccoli make you strong? Why do car trips take so long? Oh, why, 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 why? Why do the clouds turn into rain? That's a very appropriate one if you're Scottish. Why aren't there more choo-choo trains? Why is a giraffe's neck so long? And why is hitting wrong? Oh, why, 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 why? Why do we have to go back home? Why can't I do it all alone? Why can't we just stay home? Why won't you let me hold your phone? Oh, why, 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 why? Why does a dog make a bark? Why can't I put my mouth on a grocery cart? This was pre-COVID, by the way, so just chucking that one out there. Why is it so hard to walk uphill? Why would I ever want to stay still? Some parents can relate to that one. Oh, why, 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 why? So there's our Freckoland why, right? And a lot of those questions are cute. They're very cute, right? And, and, and I laugh at them and I chuckle, them, I chuckle at them because there's family memories in, in that song, right? But then when I think about the art of questioning that my kids are so good at, every now and then there's ones that are not cute and they're really, really tough. Really tough. And so I think about questions that I had and conversations I had with my kids even from a young age, like, why is there cancer? And why did grandma have to get it, right? Or I think about other questions like, why... Why did why did we have to why do we have to move? Why why are we not able to go home, right? Or questions that are yeah really difficult. Why why does God let there be sickness? Okay, and all these questions right our kids are asking them. And as I as I interact with people and, and chat and 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 look at my own life and my own times of questioning. One of the things I, I come across often is when I'm talking with people is as we have these questions and these big questions come up and we find ourselves at times even questioning God, right? Because we, we do, right? There's, there's times where we then wrestle with that from the standpoint of, can I even ask those questions? Like as a Christian, what does it mean if I'm asking questions about God or his nature or to God or why is this happening? And, and we wrestle with that, right? I think we often wrestle with that. And so we get to this point where even in our own walk of faith, there can be this whole, you know, this, this, this wrestling where we're like, is, is it all right to ask questions? You know, can I, can I do that? Why, why is this going on? Does this mean I have little faith? You know, this is, this is kind of the internal dialogue we start having 
when we have these questions and we think, oh, if we're a good little Christian boy or a good little Christian girl, we shouldn't be asking these questions, right? But when I look through Scripture, I see a lot of questions. I see a lot of questions. Psalm 10, verse 1. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Ever asked that question? Ever felt guilt because you've asked that question? Right? And wrestled with that and struggled with it? But here we see it in Scripture. And actually, when you look throughout the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament, you see a lot of questions being asked and a lot of whys. And sometimes God answers it. Sometimes he doesn't, right? Sometimes it's a yes, sometimes it's a no, sometimes it's a maybe. We'll get to that in a, in a few minutes. Job, this is the interesting one. We say job in Scotland, right? But Job, yeah, that's how you pronounce it here, right? When you, when you look through chapter one, you kind of see this whole interaction and you're like, what, <laughs> what is happening, right? And Job is living faithfully and, and you, there's this interaction between Satan and in God, where Satan's like, aye, but you've given him the, the hedge of protection, that phrase that we often use. You know, you've, you've blessed him. God's like, well, if, if all of that was taken away, I still think he would serve faithfully. So it becomes this kind of thing, well, let's see, right? And so he gets hit with one thing after another, after another, after another, after another, and his life starts falling apart around him to the point then that his wife basically questions him and says, why don't you just curse God and die, right? Enough. And all of his friends are asking him, why is all this going on, right? And you look at Job this whole time through, and he's like remaining to the point where he's like, it's, you know, God, God's blessed me, you know, I'm, I'm blessed. You know, do I take just the hard times and the good? You know, it's just, this is kind of this thing that, that, that goes on. But when you get to chapter 13, he says this, so only grant me two things, then I will not hide myself from your face. Withdraw your hand far from me. And let not dread of you terrify me. Then call and I will answer. Or let me speak and you reply to me. How many are my iniquities and my sins? Make me know my transgression and my sin. Why do you hide your face and count me as your enemy? And so this time in Job's life where he's losing literally everything around him. He's asking a question. All right. I think God can handle our questions. Now, his response later on, chapter 24, I think it is, is, you know, he answers, who is this that darkens my counsel? Almost like, who, who do you think you are? And then from there on, he basically is like, I am God and you are not. And sometimes that's the answer to the why question. Are we all right with that? He's all right with us asking the question and we can still wrestle, right? Job wrestled with it. And by the time that you get to the end of this book, you end up seeing this restoration this, this, you know, things coming back to him in this time of abundant blessing as well. But I wonder if you speak to Job how he would feel at this time. But he asks the question, why, right? Habakkuk, so in the Minor Prophets, you get this really, really interesting book, right? So Habakkuk, from a historical standpoint, is written, so it's after the fall of Israel, right? So Assyria have come in and they've laid waste to Israel, and it's no more. Judah's still holding strong, okay? So Habakkuk is, I think it's Jehoiakim. I can't remember which Jehoiah. There's, there's Jehoiakim, Jehoiashin. There's a couple Jehoiahs, right? But it's one of those ones, right? So Habakkuk's in there in the middle of that. The Babylonians are about to come. So it's kind of this period where there's a lot of stuff that's going on. And Habakkuk, this whole way that this book is laid out is a question and answer session with God. And it's tough questions, okay? So as he begins in chapter 1, the prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received, how long, Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen or cry out to you violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife. Conflict abounds. The law is paralyzed. Justice never prevails. The wicked him and the righteous so that justice is perverted. And he's looking around at his nation and he's asking these questions. And he's like, we're supposed to be God's people, but the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails because all of this stuff is going on. And he's like, God, what, what's happening here, right? 
you know, if you are God and we are your people, why, am I, why are we surrounded by wickedness? Why are you tolerating wrongdoing? Why is destruction and violence? So it's all these whys. Tough questions, right? And I think we can relate to them. I honestly think we can relate to them when we think of different things going on in our life or, or in our culture or in our nation around us. Sometimes we ask these very questions ourselves. And so the interesting thing with Habakkuk, unlike Job where it's, who is this that darkens my counsel is the answer, right? Here, God answers. And his answer here in verse 5, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. And I think Habakkuk's like, yes, get in there. We're going to see justice, right? He's answering me. And my, my prayers are going to be answered here. You know, we're, we're, I'm, I'm distraught at the unrighteousness around me. Verse 6, I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. And so when you look through Habakkuk, he's saying, my people, everything is just going wrong. It's horrendous. God, why? And what are you going to do about it? And God's answer is, I am going to do something about it. Be utterly amazed. You're not going to believe it. I'm going to use the Babylonians, and they're going to come in, and they're going to lay this smack down on your people. And it will be like, it's, like, like nothing you've ever seen before, right? Is that the answer that Habakkuk was looking for? I don't think so. Because right here, a little bit on, he's asking, wait a minute. <laughs> are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute, to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up more righteous than themselves? And so Habakkuk's like, wait a minute, these guys? You're going to use these guys? Are you serious? You're going to use Babylon? Like, look at what they do. Look at their wickedness. Look at their unrighteousness. Like, I'm talking about stuff that's happening here in Judah, and you're going to use guys that are even worse to come in and, 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 and just, you know, wipe us out. And so in Habakkuk, there's this whole thing of questioning, right? This whole thing of questioning. And I think when, there's, when we get to the point where we're wrestling, it's a, it's a growth part on our faith. And you see this in Habakkuk once we get towards the end, right? And it's in this context where you end up seeing this answer that comes as a result, okay? And so God's answer here is write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. It seems slow wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. And then what in verse 4? Behold, his soul is puffed up. It's not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. Okay? And his whole point is everything, you don't know the big picture and you don't understand what's going to happen. Yes, Babylon is a wicked nation and I am going to use them to cart away, to destroy Jerusalem, to do things that you're not even going to believe. And you're going to question that. But ultimately what I'm seeking is righteousness. And when we look through Israel's history and they come back from exile, right, they start seeking this and seeking his righteousness and living for that, for the most part. I mean, we'll get to that part maybe another time, right? But ultimately, that's what he's doing here. And he's basically saying to Habakkuk, you're not, you're not going to get it. You're not going to understand it. But this is the end goal. And this is what I see. This is the answer to why. And so Habakkuk 2.4, you end up seeing that then coming through into Romans chapter 1, verse 17. We see it in Galatians 3.11. We see it in Hebrews, where this theme is resounding, where Habakkuk 2.4 continually is quoted, the righteous shall live by faith. And nothing's ever changed with that. Now, sometimes we need our wake-up calls, but this is the goal. And that's what's happening there, is that wake-up call. And so what you end up seeing then towards the end of chapter 2 is almost kind of like what's happening with Job and he's like, who do you think you are? He finishes, he gets to the point as he's finishing the chapter and he says this, 
The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. He is God, and we are not. But part of that thing with being human is still wrestling with that questioning, right? And Habakkuk shows, and Psalms show, and you look at the life of Abraham as he questioned when he was given some promises. You look at Mary as she's questioning the messenger, like, how can this be, right? You see all the way through the scripture, people wrestling and questioning. And that in its own right isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's our journey of faith. That's why it's there. We can relate to that in a big way, okay? And so what you end up coming to at the end of Habakkuk is in the middle of your um, bulletin this morning. And so this is the end of chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. And it says this, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. So Habakkuk, as he is wrestling with some heavy stuff that's going on, and then doesn't like the answer that God gives him, and is wrestling with processing that, then in chapter 3 gets to this massive prayer where he's just pouring his heart out to God in prayer saying, I don't necessarily understand, but I trust you, you be glorified. And this is where he gets to, is the yet. It's why, you know, we sing songs like, it is well with my soul, right? And it's written because the, the, the writer of that song lost his family in a shipwreck, lost his whole family in a shipwreck, right? Lost them all. And it was him alone, left alone. And his response to that, right, is being able to pen that song, it is well with my soul, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. And that's Habakkuk's response. And so really, as we're looking this morning, I want to finish with looking at the life of Christ. And I think there's some important stuff that we're going to get to see from this. But really what I want to be focusing on is just reminding us that questioning in and of itself, it's part of our growth process. My kids ask me a million questions all the time because they're seeking to learn, right? They just want to know. And some of those are really easy answers. And some of those are go ask your mother answers. And some, and some, exactly, loads of them actually, depending on the day, right? And some of those are actually really, really difficult conversations, but it's all this growth process. And it's the same as we are walking in our faith as well. And there's times where we're going to have some gut-wrenching questions that we're bringing to the Lord, right? There will be. There'll be those times where we're like, why God? Why? Asking the same questions that my kids are asking. And those questions in and of, themse- in and of themselves God can handle those. Scripture's filled with them. And then I look to the life of his son. And so as we then think about Jesus and we think about his interactions and the people that he is around and the ways in which he interacts with the world around him, it's actually really interesting if you sit down and look at the amount of times Jesus asks questions. Sometimes we kind of get scared of questions, right? Because we're like, oh, we have to have all the answers. Or sometimes we think we have to give the answers. But sometimes people ask Jesus a question and he doesn't give an answer. Well, he does, but his answer is another question. Because it's about that processing and making them think and working their way through it and figuring it out as it goes along, okay? And so when you look at the life of Christ, I think about like the ways in which he teaches and his methods and the ways in which people learn. We have loads of instances where it says he went out preaching, but we really only have a handful of times where those sermons are actually recorded in their entirety, right? Five or six, okay? When you look at it, okay? When you look at the whole kind of discourse that's, that's recorded. We have over 300 questions that Jesus asks in the Gospels. 300 questions that Jesus asks. And I think there's a lot to learn even just in the questions. Now, don't worry, because you're looking at the clock. What clock? There is no clock. That's why Robin goes over every now and then, by the way. But you're thinking, man, are we about to go through 300 questions? We're not about to go through 300 questions. But when he's, when he's, when he's interacting in this way, there are times that those questions are specifically towards his disciples, and maybe he's making them think, okay? Or it's an answer to a question they may have, and he'll ask them another question. There are times in his questioning where it's actually part of a lesson or part of a sermon. The Sermon on the Mount is actually filled with loads and loads of questions, and it's a seed thought, 
as he then explains it. And so it's a teaching tool that he uses. Teachers, you ask a lot of questions, right? And you get some really funny answers. I bet if you recorded all the answers you get from kids, you would have some funny things to, to, to share, right? But you ask a lot of questions. It's a teaching tool. There are times when he uses questions in a way to divert. Um, so say it's the scribes and the Pharisees and some heavy things that they're hitting them with. He'll use it to divert, right? There's times where he uses it to challenge them in a way that's actually pretty gut-punching. Um, are you, you claim to be a teacher of Israel and you're asking this question, like the, the ways in which he challenges them. And so we're going to look at a couple of them because I think there's some interesting things that we'll see from them. And so I'm going to start with this one, and it's in John chapter 1. And so in John chapter 1, as, uh, as Jesus is, is, is interacting, he sees John, right? So there's this interaction with John and John's disciples, and this is interesting. So it says in verse 35, the next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And John, as being John the Baptist, looks at Jesus, and, he, and as he walks by, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God. So two of his disciples heard him say this, and they start following Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following, and he said to them, What are you seeking? There's the question. There's the question that's in the text. What are you seeking? And it's a deep one, right? It is. And I think it's a question that we all have to ask. What are we seeking? What's our goal behind following Jesus? Why are we seeking? What are we looking for? What are you seeking? Okay. So he's asking John's disciples, you've been following John. Now you're looking at following me. Why? What are you seeking? What are you looking to get out of this? And so they say to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? And he says, come and see. So he came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him, right? And so that's like right off the very back, just as they're beginning to follow, he's asking them and he's challenging them. What are you seeking? What are you looking for? And that whole thing about our questioning, at the end of the day, when it comes to these times where we wrestle, it shows that we have a seeker's heart. And a lot of times we're asking ourselves in the midst of all of this and we're questioning God, what am I seeking? Okay? Who am I seeking? And how am I trying to follow? And how am I trying to grow through this process? When you get into the Sermon on the Mount, I mentioned earlier about the, the, the seed thought questions that, that he often has. And I'll be honest, we've had a couple of really tough months when it comes to some health stuff and then medical bills that come up as a result of that health stuff and all this kind of stuff. And you start looking at like your budget and you're like, oh, no, man, how are we going to do this? And you start looking at everything like, what, what are we going to do? Like your trips to Wilmington, like constantly in Raleigh and Durham. And, and, and then you think, okay, and now we've got like, recession and inflation and everything's expensive, right? Gas started going down this week. That's kind of cool, but it's still up above three bucks, right? So you look at everything, right? And, and, and you think, man, all of this pressures in life, where is my paycheck going each month? I know I'm not the only one who feels that, right? Right? Okay. I'm seeing some nodding heads, not from falling asleep nodding heads, but I'm seeing some nodding, nodding heads because we're, we're tracking with that, right? And so in the midst of this, you see this passage where it's like, hey, Nothing's ever really changed with that, right? When it comes to our anxiety and provision and how we're going to make ends meet and living paycheck to paycheck because right here in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, therefore I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? So again, beginning with questions. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Questions. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? In fact, oftentimes it has the exact opposite effect, right? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Questions. Therefore, don't be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
and all of these things will be added to you. Go back to Habakkuk. The righteous shall live by what? The righteous shall live by faith. Okay? Go back to John chapter 1. What are you seeking? So here, again, the answer to these questions, verse 33, seek first what? The kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I don't know about you, but I needed to hear that this week. I had some times where I've really wrestled with some stuff and looked at some stuff and sweated about some stuff, and there's an awesome reminder there about that very thing. So sometimes as we're prepping for sermons, uh, it very much speaks to us and the things that are going on in our lives and our hearts at that time. So verse 34, therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And so carrying on from that, we, we did a campaign once where we um, kind of had this leaflet where it was along the lines of, there are so many questions that are going on in life, right? We have big questions. The leaflet said that. Um, and then we turned to this verse. We've got questions, just ask. If it's the acronym, ask, A-S-K, ask, seek, knock, right? So Matthew 7, 7 through 11, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So again, a passage that's filled with so many questions, but contained within that, there's the message to keep asking. Now, I get it, right? Context, it's a lesson on prayer, but ultimately, it's also this reminder for us that questions are all right. Asking is all right. Don't feel guilty in those times where we're asking. Focus on God. It's part of our growth process as we continue to ask and as we continue to turn to Him. And so this was kind of along the lines of how that leaflet was laid out. Ask, seek, knock. And so Jesus, even in His teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, has that reminder for us just to ask. Luke 7. I've got two more passages and that's it. I'm done, okay? So Luke 7, this is, this is one of them. This is one of the ones where there's some interesting questions that He asks the scribes and the Pharisees, right? So he's at a Pharisee's house. He's at Simon's house. Um, and when you, you see what happens here, I'm going to read this just to give the context of then the questioning and what happens as a result of it. So let's read 36 through 40. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and he reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. She wiped them with the hair of her head. She kissed his feet. She anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, didn't say it out loud, but he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is what? She is a sinner. Verse 40, Jesus answering him, so he's perceived his thoughts, right? Jesus answering him said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. And that thing he has is a question, actually a couple of them. So he asks a question about debtors, right? Our credit reports. Yay. So Luke 7, right? Starting in verse 41. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? So here's your teaching experience and your learning opportunity here, Simon, right? You're looking at this woman and you're saying, she's a sinner, she's a sinner, she's a sinner. Okay? That's the interaction that's just happened. How dare he? How, if, he even, if he was a prophet, he wouldn't even let her near him, right? As that's what he's just said in the previous passage, okay? So Jesus asks these questions. Who's going to love that, that, that moneylender more when that debt is given up? And so Simon's response, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt, and he said to him, you've judged rightly. And then verse 44 is huge. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, 
do you see this woman? And I'm going to answer that from Simon's perspective. No. He didn't. He didn't see the woman. He saw the sin. He saw the reputation. He saw what she was known for. He saw the baggage, right? He didn't see an act of repentance where she got down on her knees weeping and washed his feet. He saw the stigmas, he saw the titles, and he saw the sin, but he did not see the woman. Jesus saw the woman, and he saw her for, for so much more than what she was known for, because he saw her, and he saw that act of faith, the righteous shall live by faith, okay? And so look, and, he, and then he schools them. I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. She's wet my feet with her tears. She's wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she's anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven, and they still don't get it, because then in verse 39, they begin saying among themselves, Who's this who even forgives sins? Who does he think he is? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. He saw her. He saw her. And he asked the questions. And he asked the question to Simon to make him think. But he asked that question on, do you see this woman? I think to impact her even more when you think about that whole interaction. And so there's a lot of weight behind Jesus' questions, okay? This one. Ross and I were hanging out yesterday and he mentioned what he was talking about on the Lord's table and I'm like, I've already got my PowerPoint done, right? Um, it's, it's totally corresponding and how well it fits in. Because we think about the tough questions that we cry out to God even in our darkest times. And then we come to Mark chapter 15. When the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was a son of God. Now Ross, when he went, uh, when he was talking, he went back to Psalm chapter 22. And there's a couple of schools of thought when it comes to this. Psalm 22 begins with this very thing. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so there's a question and there's a discussion along the lines of, was Jesus crying out because that's how he felt? Was he directing that question to God? Was he calling up to his father? Why have you forsaken me? Why? I asked this cup to pass from me, okay? And I did say, your will be done, but I'm still wrestling with it. Why is this happening? Why have you forsaken me? And when you think of him taking on the sins of the world as our sacrifice, and the repercussions that happen from that, it's a very real cry to God. On the other hand, there are those that look at it and they say, well, he's quoting Psalm 22, which is very much a messianic psalm. It's a psalm that's pointing ahead to the Messiah. And when you start looking through Psalm 22 about some of the things that are contained within there, casting out their, casting lots for clothing, right? And a lot of the details when you go through it, okay? and you then tie it into the crucifixion account, you see so many fulfillments even on it. So as he's on the cross, it's almost like he's shouting, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in doing that, he's pointing back to Psalm 22, reminding the crowd who would have recognized that, by the way, this is the Messiah. And if you know this passage, you're seeing its fulfillment right now. And there's a couple of schools of thought on it. I don't think it's an either or scenario think it's a both and because ultimately Jesus is pointing and saying yes I am the Messiah and I am the fulfillment of that and they recognize that 
But you've also got him in his darkest hour while he's hanging on a cross and going through that pain and thinking about the separation that is about to come because of the sin that he's taken on his shoulders because of our sins. And he's crying out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so there's times where we cry out the same thing in our life. And I think about that. I think about Hebrews chapter 4 where it talks about uh, the, him being able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, right? He's able to connect because even Jesus has had that time of questioning as well. And so when it comes to the questions that are in our life and the things that we wrestle with, I hope today as we've gone through them that we can be strengthened with the fact that, hey, I mean, nothing's new, right? Throughout Scripture, we see people wrestling with God. Israel means wrestles with God, right? And so we see that all the time as people wrestle with God and have these questions. And we're all in different stages of our faith when it comes to our questioning and our wrestling. And sometimes we're on those mountaintop moments where we're just praising. And sometimes we're in the valleys where we're shouting, why? Eloi, Eloi, (laughs) why? Okay? And I don't know where we're at this morning. I want you to know if you're at a point where you are in a valley and you can connect with that, we are here to pray with you and be a support to you in any way that you can be, that we can be. And I want you to know that those questions are all right. And some of those questions I don't necessarily have answers for, but I'll be with you as you're asking those questions. And we will absolutely be with you, praying with you as you are going through that. But you may also be here with another question in your mind. And I think about um, Peter on the day of Pentecost um, when, when he preaches to uh, the, the crowd that are there in, in the book of Acts, right? And as he's preaching to them, he brings them to this point. He basically brings them to, to this right here. He brings them to the cross, okay, in Acts, in Acts chapter 2. And he shows some fulfillments of some messianic psalms, and he says basically he comes to a conclusion in verse 36. And that conclusion is this. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This Jesus whom you crucified. And so when they hear this in verse 37, they were cut to the heart and they say to Peter and the rest of the apostles, and it's a big question, probably one of the most important questions that you'll ever ask. Brothers, what shall we do? What, what can we do, right? What shall we do? What should we do? And here's his response in verse 38. Peter says to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And he's still calling And we're still asking questions and we're still wrestling with it. But Jesus is the answer. Okay. And the righteous shall live by faith. Responding by faith is the answer. And that's the point that he gets to there in Acts chapter 2. So we're going to offer an invitation in a second. Jim's going to stand. uh, Well, we all stand and sing. Jim will uh, offer an invitation song. So I want you to know from the bottom of our heart, the questions come. And we're here with you in those times of questioning. And if you have anything that's on your heart, we will pray with you. We'll have an elder up front. We'll have an elder towards the back. If you have to respond to the gospel, if you're asking that question, what shall we do? What shall I do to be saved? We read the answer in Acts chapter 238, and I would love to talk to you more about that. So the the invitation is available while we stand and sing the invitation song.